Good evening to all of you out there. Tonight, we discuss a topic. The title, of course, in the schedule is Water Woes. But there's some changes I'm going to go over with you guys, and I hope it's not entirely too nerdy. But it's something I feel that uh, all of us should know about. Some of these um, expectations of danger that people haven't talked about. It's time to clarify those things. In fact, thank you, Lord, we're going to be clarifying quite a bit. For example, um, there are so many talks out there, so many theories out there that sometimes it becomes a guessing game as to whose theory is correct or what should you really watch for. At the core of our talks, you will deal with your preparedness state with your families and your friends and yourselves by way of faith, but most importantly, some of the nerdy topics on geology, some of the nerdy topics about um, water, the water levels rising. And for example, let me not scare you guys, but there was a projection that by the year 2030, we would likely see a three foot uh, rise in water levels across the board all throughout the earth. Right, Lots of money has been poured in recently into observations, more calculations than some of the best minds have been put down there because they're really scared now. They're frightened of a few things. And we're talking about a multi-billion dollar research project with lots of assets uh, poured into this research project to see what's happening with the water. As I said before, the past projection, which was last year, was 2030, that ocean levels would rise five feet. That projection has been cut down to two years, two to three years. The ocean levels will rise eight to 15 feet. I'm going to explain that to you tonight. That's a, that's a stark, uh, that's a very frightening projection, I know, right? And believe me, now, these projections are not coming from theorists. That's not where they're coming from. In fact, once this group makes a, that type projection, they begin to prepare for it right away. Because normally, this group has, uh, they've not missed the mark yet. And so, they often work, or the budgets that the military has, that the government has, that uh, all these agencies have, normally work from the premise that this research group is very good and very accurate in what they say. So they start they started spending money as soon as they found out about these uh, new projections. We're going to go over that in this talk. Because I think you'd want to know if the ocean levels were about to suddenly rise and why they would rise. We're going to have a small example, just one, one of, of uh, I believe it, 16 places on earth there's they're really worried about trigger points you could call them and by the end of this conversation you'll see what they're actually worried about and why that projection has been drastically decreased all right also you know this leads in due to this problem that they have found it will also change ocean temperatures by at least uh, up to 12 degrees in specific areas. Now, that can decrease or increase currents of the oceans. If the currents change in the oceans, so will the storms rage and the winds will rise. We're going to go over those dynamics also so that you have a grasp, a general grasp of what is happening so that you don't, you're not frightened, right? But uh, I've looked at some of those projections personally and I've had a few conversations with individuals to see what the validity of this finding was because just because they trust these teams and these teams have not been wrong yet doesn't mean they're not going to be wrong in the future. The problem is some of the findings and some of the formulas that they're using, they're quite, uh, they're quite accurate, but the temperatures from the time of the report, even to this very day, the temps have increased and the increase in temperature is causing the date margin to collapse, but the temperatures have gone up two degrees since they put the report out. 
So now we're looking at something that is, uh, that could very well be within a two year time span. Ocean levels changing the face of the planet for a little bit. We'll go over those dynamics because it's, uh, in certain places, it's already happening, right? Already happening. So hopefully you guys understand it. You'll see it because when you don't understand a topic, that's when fear settles in, right? Your imagination runs wild. You start thinking of all these different scenarios. You assume, which is very bad to do. Not one of you has to assume anything. You can know the truth. Remember that, right? You're a child of the most high. You can know the truth. You don't have to assume. But a lot of people are going to be frightened by this. You already, there are folks who are already nervous. The topic is very sensitive. So, but I will go over the public information with you, right? That you may not have seen, you may not know about. I'll go over with some of that public information with you so that you can have uh, a better idea where the problem is, what the problem is, why it's, it's increasing, right? Because this issue also is going to affect Russia big time. They're going to be waterlogged here pretty soon. I wouldn't be shocked if some of their, um, some of the some of the places where people dwell in Russia just simply won't be there. It's going to be inundated by water. And all this will happen right before the driest time the earth has ever seen. So this will go over. I'll be with you guys in a few minutes right here at COT and we will begin. I'll be right back, everybody. Let's go ahead and begin. Shall we? Let me make sure that uh, all things are set right. Boy, what interesting days we're in. Folks, we know in the Bible, um, there are some very disturbing scriptures in there, but your father is doing everything. Never forget something. This is God's creation, his creation. It's nobody else's creation, but it's his. He will command his creation always. Other powers, they just kind of manipulate it. God commands it. Everything, anything that's inbound, anything that's um, developed or any of those things, right? They're confined within his creation. But God can command every element of his creation. Every single one. Never fear large bodies that you may begin to see in the heavens. Never fear the stories that will float around this earth. Right? Never fear that. There will come a time when people are in their homes and they're going to be afraid to come out. They're going to be hit from too many sides. So you can't have your mind in the realm of imagination. You can't have your mind infested with anger. Right, don't lose yourselves that way, but stay grounded as best you can and actively fight violence within yourselves, actively fight accusation within yourselves, actively fight these things. That is part of the good fight of faith. Stop condemning yourselves. Stand up and take your position in Christ, not within yourselves, in Christ. Don't do anything for man's admiration. Don't let that be your positive feedback for doing things in life, that somebody is going to come and recognize you and elevate you. Don't do that. Seek to be pleasing in all that you do. And in these times, you will see the salvation of the Lord on a continuous basis. But keep your footing. Don't go astray, right? You've come too far to go astray. You've come too far to give up. You've come too far to go backward. All right? Now, you guys here at COT and, and some of you guys who are older, you've heard about some of the concerns the Navy had a long time ago about water levels. You guys no doubt heard about some of the naval research maps that were distributed a long time ago. It was talked about. But there's a reason why, right? I'm going to talk about that reason why because it's not classified. That's not classified. Nor is that anybody's intellectual property. It's just something that was is being watched for a long time. And this is one of, you know, dozens of examples of uh, trouble spots in the earth, right? Dozens. 
But water, the ocean, is becoming quite uh, different these days, right? We have heating from below the ocean. We have current changes in the ocean. We have migrations that have begun. Whales are in the d- different spots because their feeding grounds have been altered. The chemistry has been altered. We have massive ice melts. Um, massive ice melts. What are the major problems that's happening? Is at the ocean floor, right? Now, for a long time, in the ocean, things have been quite uh, you know, normal. Things have been melting, yes, but but normal, right? Manageable. But there was always coming a crisis point when things would have melted too far. And, and hopefully you guys have a good idea through this uh, one small example. I'm going to use this one. I was going to use another, but I'm not going to do that because I'm not sure. I'm just not sure about that one yet. Because of what's, uh, you know, classified, what's not classified. But the ocean floor is heating up, period, right? It's heating up. And if we were to take our attention down to you guys who are on computers, your own devices, pull up Google Earth so that you can track what I'm doing also. Pull up, uh, not Google Earth, Google Maps. So I want you guys to see this for yourselves. And it's one thing to talk about it, but when you start to look into it yourselves, you get a bit of a different story. But if we were to take um, Antarctica, for example, there's an issue in Antarctica. And we're not talking about, uh, you know, w- w- what most people talk about, but there's an issue there in Antarctica. The ocean floor, right? The crust of the earth is heating extremely. Uh, um, it's going up in extreme measures in certain places, heating up, changing the structure of the ocean floor. It's heating up, currents are changing, everything else. But this is causing ice to melt. And if you've ever taken an ice cube, and you, you have an ice cube on a countertop, right? That ice cube, if it's on a warm countertop, is, is, um, is going to melt from beneath faster than it does from above, right? Why? Because of contact, correct? And Arnica, right, at the poles, we have large amounts of ice in these desert places. They call them deserts uh, because the precipitation is not very high, so it's considered dry. Maybe they get an inch of rain per year. That that would be a desert, okay? The problem is that ice does not melt. It doesn't go anywhere, so it just simply compacts itself and becomes thicker and thicker and thicker until there's miles of ice. But underneath, on the ocean floor, the ocean floor temperatures... Where these glaciers are, like um, Thwaites Glacier, Pine Island Glacier, right? That's in Antarctica. It is, it used to be somewhat cool, right? The point at which the glacier contacts the ocean floor used to be quite stable. And the retraction line, which is this, the ocean floor is at one temperature. And it slowly melts away the glacier from the bottom up, right? What this does... If you take an ice block and you put a hot knife at the at the bottom, right there at the tabletop, start scooting it back, you're going to cause a gap in the ice at the bottom. You're going to melt away until that, that knife goes all the way through it. At that point, once it goes all the way through, that ice must fall. It'll hit the countertop again. Gravity's going to work. It's going to pull it down. It's going to hit it again. In this case, the ocean floors are heating up. There's a line at which the ice contacts the ocean floor, right? Now, for a long time, it's been gaining ground or retracting, meaning it's left like a diving board. That glacier looks like a diving board. So underneath this glacier is nothing. Now, before, maybe it was, um, maybe it was, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 feet of a lip. Well, over the years, through contact, that lip has grown bigger and bigger, right? Which changes, it's not, uh, it doesn't have a 40 or 50 foot lip now. It has a mile lip, right? It's continuing. That lip gets bigger and bigger. Why? Because the ocean floors are heating up. If we were to just talk about Thwaites Glacier, 
The issue with this is, and it's quite popular, the issue is they know for a fact that the ocean floors are heating up almost exponentially, causing the bottom half of this glacier to absolutely melt away. And it's going to fall right to the ocean, right? For a long time, there's a ring around Antarctica regarding ocean currents, a ring around it. Right, So when warm water gets near Antarctica, it hits this current that goes around it, cooling off the water, and it never really touches that ice cap. For a long time, this happened. But no one really expected the ground to heat up the way it is. Right, Not this fast, not this soon. The, the ground temperatures that we're experiencing now, they projected to have in the year 3,120. That was uh, 2000, and uh, I believe they projected that 2011. We're having those temperatures now. It's only 2022, so you can see the projections have been greatly diminished, right? Um, because the, the the crust of the Earth is heating up very fast, causing these glaciers. The bottom melt of these glaciers has been tremendous. In fact, downright scary to a lot of people. Right, A few of these glaciers, the smaller ones, have already collapsed. Here's what happens if Thwaites Glacier collapses. The moment it goes off in the ocean, right? which, to be honest with you, that's, that is projected to happen within a two-year time span. And we're just talking about Thwaites Glacier. You do realize there are dozens of other glaciers out there that can do worse damage than Thwaites Glacier. So, but immediately, once this thing falls off, because it will crack one day, it's going to be like a diving board that's hung out too far. That weight's going to be too heavy, to, and it's just going to crack and fall off. Once this happens, because this is um, is going to add to the volume of water in the ocean. Now, now, keep this in mind. See, a glacier is not really dangerous. If a glacier is floating around in the water and it melts, no big deal. It, that would be just like having a, a bowl full of ice and water. If the ice melts, no big deal. Why? Because that ice is already accounted for in the water itself. All right? So, waterborne glaciers are not the problem. Land-based glaciers are the problem. And in this case, because of the sheer age of this glacier, right? If it falls off, it could raise ocean levels by 25 feet all over the earth in less than a week. You hear me? In less than one week, 25 feet is, is, is that, that's destructive, correct? It's very destructive. Now, we are losing water. We are. We're losing water. But if that glacier falls off, and it will, they project within the next uh, uh, two to three years. If it falls off, that's a 20 foot, 25 foot rise across the board. You do realize that would take out every coastal city there is, save for some that are high in the mountains overseeing a cliff and then they oversee the ocean. But most of your coast, coastlines are going to be drawn back significantly, right? Significantly. This projection has caused them to become quite nervous quite nervous and believe me resources follow in fact some of this uh some of the food issues that we're having and, and some of the transportation issues no doubt they coincide with these new discoveries and this is a preparedness group so they help the government get prepared which means they allocate funding and everything else they start building things to help the continuance of, of, of government and special people in the earth should one of these events happen, right? Now, one of the reasons for the naval map was Thwaites Glacier. Do you guys know that? They never thought, however, that the retraction of this ice would happen so quickly. Uh, back then, they projected the year 3,120, right? Back uh, a few years ago, they projected 2030, right? That projection now, is about 2023 to 2026. Not good. A lot of people seem to agree that 2023 is, is going to be called the doom point. They call Thwaites Glacier the doom glacier, by the way. And it's got everybody 
scratching their heads and worried. They have committed quite a bit of research uh, to the bottom of this glacier because they need the precise time that this thing will break. There's no way they can stop it. They can't. Um, the currents are working against any refreeze of the water. Of course, we know the temperatures are rising, but when you're dealing with the Arctic, right, which has, uh, it gets very cold there, and plus snow has an effect that, that um, snow has a property that will reflect sunlight, right? When, when snow falls, you need to know about this so you understand all of it. When the, when the uh, snow falls, which is essentially ice crystals, they are highly reflective, Right, ice, highly reflective uh, ice crystals. Right, so when when they actually begin to fall, there's something called the albedo effect, and when it snows, they reflect light back into space, which then cools off the area. So the poles have these properties. Right, they have these properties. This albedo effect because of falling snow, because of the the ice crystals that have formed all over the place. Nevertheless. The ocean floor is melting, and the loosening grip on the sea mount in Thwaites Glacier is enormous. There is one, uh, there's a continental shelf right there at the tip of Thwaites Glacier, right? Parts of Thwaites Glacier are shattering off. Even right now as we speak, there are cracks forming today, interestingly enough. There are cracks forming, deep cracks are forming today. So, this this increase in temperatures of the crust of the earth, right, of the crust of the earth, is causing all of these projections to be condensed. And so you're not looking at a time of 2030, 2040, 2050, as suspected before, even 3,120. You're not looking at those years. But now it's more like 2023, 2024, 2025. And many of them are absolutely convinced by the year 2025, we're going to live in a brand new world, right? I'm sorry, by the year 2024, we're going to be living in a, a, a new world, a world without certain coasts. Now, in this case, if that if this breaks, here's what will happen. First, the first day it breaks off, first couple of days, you're going to have a lot of shearing and breaking. Then you're going to have further breaking and disbursement. Once that disbursement begins, the water levels are going to slowly start rising. At the rim of the earth is a big rim of water. This will no doubt that this effect is going to be um, a cascading effect that will affect many other systems more than just water. Once the rim of the earth takes on a specific volume, it begins to affect the Earth's rotation in a big way, right? Everything is thrown off. The balance of the Earth is thrown off. And so we're going to see a decrease in that water level. So then at the equator, I wouldn't be surprised that at the equator, that water level drops by at least, what, 50, 60 feet, which means all that water that is hundreds of feet high at the equator. Do you guys know this? It's hundreds of feet high. That's going to drop. 40, 50 feet, that 40 or 50 foot water drop is going to be caused by the introduction of colder waters going into these warm currents. As soon as that happens and it drops 40 or 50 feet, it will increase the back currents of this water, right? And that increase in back waters is going to drop that ring around the earth, that rim of the earth at the equator. It's going to drop it by hundreds of feet. That decrease at the rim the water level because colder water is a bit heavier than warmer water once it drops all that water is going to be dispersed in less than two days all across the globe so then that literally means in one night in one day in the scope of a few hours you could mow your grass go inside take a shower come back outside and your yard would have uh, six feet of water in it, right? That's what it means. That's what it means. And this, this is not by no means will this be the end of anything. It's going to be a condition that we're going to live through, that we will see, that we're going to have to adjust to. And all these coastal places are going to have to deal with that influx of water. 
with water without a tsunami, water without an earthquake, water without a volcano. All because all this ice, right? All this ice, um, once it distributes itself in the ocean, it's going to affect the rim of the earth. That will in turn affect all the water levels across the globe. Even if it didn't affect the rim of the earth, you're still looking at a 15 foot water rise. You're still seeing that. Right? You're still going to see that. And believe it or not, Russia's going to get the grunt of the trouble because they have, they have a, they have a permafrost up there. Well, after many surveys, after much field work, that permafrost is at its, um, is at the point now where it could actually, that permafrost could actually be totally gone in certain areas within the, I, I say the scope of a few months. If that happens, you're looking at massive mudslides. You're looking at the potential of entire, entire um, settlements being sucked into the earth, drowned essentially, in what would look like ground that's being affected by liquefaction, right? So it'd be like a quicksand or something like that. You just, you know, you wake up one day, you, first there'd be a city out there, the next day, no city. That's not the only place that's in trouble. Alaska's the, the, the geology in Alaska will most certainly change also so all these different areas are going to change and when it comes to Greenland and Iceland oh boy that's going to really cause us some issues and problems right it really will because not only will this affect the poles right as far as the water levels is going to affect Greenland and Iceland and the only reason certain uh, volcanoes have not really gone off there is because of the offset pressure of the ice and the ground and, and uh, some of this hardened rock that's around there. If the ice melts in the Arctic regions, and then we have the ocean uh, rise, the ocean levels start going up, it will begin to heat up the ocean in ways you never thought possible. The currents will increase by, you know, I'd say factors of 10 knots each. That means the wind speeds, right? Because wind drives currents to a large degree. Well, a difference in ocean temperatures is going to change the way the jet stream travels. It's going to change its power. That means in the Bible, when it says men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And then it goes down to say the, 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 um, the seas and the waves roaring, right? Well, if they roar, they're roaring by wind and by storms. So we have a driver that you're looking at 200 mile an hour winds. And before you say that's impossible, don't because of this year, the already this year, there have been wind speeds recorded at 258 miles an hour. And that's by no means the top speed of winds that have been recorded on the earth. They try to make it through these media outlets like uh, the earth has never seen wind speeds that high. That's an outright lie. It, it, that's not real. In fact, if you do your homework and start looking at the poles, you'll understand that wind speeds being largely driven by by sheer cold temperatures, right? All that cold air coming down, wind speeds have exceeded 200, almost got up to 260 miles an hour. So think of that. That already happens. Okay, just think of that. All right. So um, this will then expand because that cold air, the same process that happens in the Arctic regions due to ocean temperature changes will also happen in several regions around the earth. And at that point, everything is different. At that point, our infrastructure cannot take what's happening. Hmm? Somebody says there have been 300 mile an hour winds in South Pacific. Yes, there have. There have been some gusts. I won't even name here, but these, these gusts, uh, were enough to turn two battleships around in a, in a few, in a few seconds. How do you turn a battleship around, right? Going out and she's just charging along and then foof, the, that wind was so powerful, right? Now battleships don't have sails. So that's a force that, um, is very difficult to contend with, right? 
But ladies and gentlemen, a long time ago, the Navy looked at this and they looked at the ice and they looked at the process of geology taking place in the ocean floors. And they knew, they said, we're, you know, there's a generation that will be in trouble. They have made their adjustments outside of Alaska in a specific area where they, where they test, uh, submarines for their, their, um, well, let's just say they test submarines deep under the water. They've been doing some other tests also, right? And they have been preparing for this for a long time. The populace really doesn't know anything about it, right? Because they're, they're, they, they are entertained, so they won't even look in that direction. But it's important for you guys to know this because you're going to see the patterns I'm going to describe. When I come back, you'll, you'll start to see these telltale signs that it's taking effect. And if you have loved ones at this time that live on living coastal places, you might want to whisper to them, hey, it's time for you to move, time for you to come, right? You don't have to convince anybody that this will happen in the future because everybody's going to know. The problem is there are choke points put on the highways. They will absolutely control movements during a time where they have to make an announcement. Uh, they already have what looks like pillboxes on every single highway in America. They will control traffic movements. If you have folks overseas, the same thing is happening. Same thing is happening. And so traffic will be interrupted. The best way to deal with this situation is, number one, to be educated about it. Not, not the stories, but the facts. The truth of it, right? To be educated. Make sure that your foundation is ripe with Christ and he will direct you into what you need to do and when you need to do it. Because if you, if a person makes a move too quick, often what happens when people make moves too quick, there's a big time uh, a spam they're going to have to deal with being in that new place. Uh, and sometimes people just lose confidence in any future right? That may have held some surprises for humanity. They start losing confidence in prophecy. They lose confidence in a bunch of things because they made the move too quick. Then they won't listen at all. Hmm? That will be very unfortunate. But education starts first. And then you start looking at some of the signs that are taking place right now that point to the ocean salinity temperatures. And migration points shifting. That 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 is a telltale sign that new water, a, a new type of water, has entered into the ocean in large amounts. Now, again, any any glacier that's floating in the ocean already is not a big deal. I don't even pay attention to that. It is land-based ice, which will add to the volume of the Earth, it, and that will in turn drive wind speeds. And then when you start to realize that the ocean floor has heated up tremendously because of volcanism, now you have that uh, double whammy type thing, right? But there's some things to watch for. My goodness, we're going to have a conversation here in a few minutes. But again, just for an example, this is by no means the big one. Do you guys know that? Thwaites Glacier is not the big one. Yes, they call it the Doomsday Glacier, but it's not the big one. It's not the big problem. There's something else. There's another glacier that is a bigger problem than Thwaites Glacier. And it's not Pine Island, which is connected to Thwaites uh, Glacier, right? It's not the um, uh, uh, Pluton-rich hotspot either. It's not It's not Mount uh, uh, Erebus volcanic complex. It's not that place either. So when you're talking about uh, uh, dozens of other spots that can absolutely add to the volume of water in the ocean, man, we have some things to cover. So, but I'm going to do that when I come back from this break. So you guys hold on to yourselves. I'll be right back in just a few minutes right here at the Council of Time. Okay, everybody, back to our conversation. Can you guys hear me okay? Let me adjust uh, one thing here. Okay, folks, so as you can see, if you understand this uh, tiny concept, you realize A maximum of two years is not big enough. It's just not enough time uh, to really do anything. That time is condensing. Now, let me bring something else into view, if I could. Most people 
when it comes to Satan, they, you really think Satan is going to spring some sort of a trap, as we call traps. But let me explain a uh, method of the enemy to you, if, if I could, please. When you guys have your dreams or something scares you, right? If it really scares you, frightens you, what is one of the first things you do? You say, Jesus, help me, or you rebuke something in the name of Jesus. You're instantly against it, correct? Isn't that right? When something startles you, when it really frightens you, you begin to rebuke it, don't you? It'll have no placement in your life. If it overwhelms you that way, you're not going to yield to it. You're going to rebuke it. You're going to say, Lord, save me. That's the last thing Satan wants you to do. He didn't want you to cry out and say, Lord, save me. That's not what he wants you to do. Now, I'm going to tie all this together real quick. I want you to think for a moment in all of your experiences. When you had these really bad ones, you cried out for Christ. So in essence, when something bad happened to you, the opposite effect of what Satan really wanted took place. You cried out for the Lord. That's not what he wanted. So I'm telling you now, he's going to do something very differently. Now, what I'm about to tell you is not hearsay. It's not hearsay. I, I'm not going to go into detail yet, into it yet. But Satan does not want to surprise anybody. He wants to win your soul, right? He, he needs your confidence. That's what he wants. He didn't want you to be frightened, so overwhelmed that you would cry out on Christ. That's not what he wants. That would defeat his entire purpose. And that's not what he did in times past. It's not how he works. When, when some of you have had these experiences in your dreams and something frightened you or something something uh, manifested that was not supposed to manifest, right? And it really frightened you. You cried out for Christ. You cried out for his help. No, no, no. He didn't need that, right? If, for example, in the political realm, now you guys put your big boy pants on, in the political realm, if we honestly saw one side of politics beating down the other side, we would take the side of the ones being beaten down, wouldn't we? Because we would see them as a victim. Correct? That wouldn't work either. What Satan has to do is he has to get you in a mindset where things are normal first. Not frightening, normal, plausible, acceptable. He has to have you there first. Some of you have had experiences in your dreams when you were young and it scared you to pieces. As you got older, you've had that similar experience, right? But it, And it caused a curiosity. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you heard about things when you were very young and it scared you. But when you were older, it caused a curiosity. There was no fear involved. There was intrigue, correct? That's how he wants you. So what does he do? How do you get a person from having high fear towards something to almost pure intrigue? Because normally that intrigue leads to worship in some form or fashion. You guys have often heard me talk about a door. A door. Somebody's coming through a door, right? Do you not know if they, if, if mankind were to just without warning spring a trap or let something come through some notable door. A lot of people on earth would rebuke it. They would. They'd stand against it, thus it could not rise. Right? Because collectively, if you begin to rebuke something, it's going to have no effect on the face of the earth. That's not what Satan wants. Satan wants to entreat people, so he has to make it grand, big, in your face, beautiful. Right? He has to appeal to you. He has to appeal to your physical senses. So he's got to impress you first with grandeur. So that when they construct this door, when this final, this final worship by specific men and women 
who have a you know unlimited amount of funds and resources, when they construct this door for ceremonial purposes, before this thing comes through, the whole world must see it as a marvel. A marvel. That way, when it does come through and the whole world sees it as a marvel, it's indeed expected. Then people will say, ah, look at that. How wonderful. Right. But if it, if it did that, if something landed and it was huge and something walked out of a door and it was, you know, everybody would have the opposite effect. They say, oh no, rebuke that because that would scare people. Right. That frightened people. People wouldn't put up with that. They say, no way. No, they're going to win you over. For many years now, Hollywood has made lots of movies, haven't they? You may not know this, but those movies have put you right where they want you. Even your arguments, even what you agree with and disagree with, is pre-fashioned. Did you know that? That's why. Did you know that Hollywood does not invest money in movies that do not support an overall goal? Steven Spielberg and all these guys who make these alien movies... They do so in a very specific pattern. Now, let's not act like we never watched a movie before, because in truth, you have, right? You have. You know you have. You've watched them. But yes, they presented these species as an enigma. For a long time, you see them as a threat, right? A threat. Um is something that the militaries muster all their forces together to fight. And for a long time, people believe that. But something else is happening right down before your eyes. They're pulling off something right before your eyes. And it's almost like nobody wants to catch on. Right? Now, that term nobody does not include you. But most people are not going to catch on. With movies of war, of that last battle and all these things in Hollywood approved, they developed within people this nervousness about any alien species or anything they would call alien, and people had reservations toward them. It even showed in some of the reports to police that how people were frightened because they saw lights. Something else has happened. They introduced them as these bloodthirsty things, but then they presented to you in real life in real life, see, the movies made them bloodthirsty. But in real life, you've heard of encounters, not necessarily believing all the stories behind them, but you've heard of encounters. As of late, as of late, you've saw the evidence that they're putting out regarding these encounters, right? They're not associating death with these encounters, are they? That's not what they're doing. They're not saying people died horrifically, you know, upon seeing this thing or that thing. You, you see nervous people, yes, but you don't see the violence. You even see the tampering. You hear about stories of them tampering with people, but those people still live. So the violence is absent. It's almost like they're doing something scientific. Most people in their psyche would say, yes, they're doing something scientific. We don't know, but scientific. And you can't quite bring up a cause to accuse them. Is what I'm saying. In the movies, you could easily accuse them. But you can't accuse them by the evidence they're putting forward now. And believe me, that evidence is, uh, well, it's leaked out very carefully. How about that? You know, these leaks that people have, those are carefully orchestrated. Each and every one. Because they go along with a, a, a kind of a story. Something that's already been written. Something I discussed with you guys years ago. And if you remember, you'll see it in play right now. I told you I would not repeat that again. I can't repeat it again. I already said what I said. And if you guys go back and listen, you're going to hear what's happening right now before your faces. Because I already described this time. But I can't echo that again. I told you back then I'd never say it again. And I'm not. But we've already covered that. If they're doing the thing right now we talked about back then. They're doing it right now before your eyes. Because most people, right, are so not threatened by these things that they're paying no attention to them. 
The Pentagon is releasing stuff and nobody cares. Your lack of feedback regarding official releases of these things tells everybody exactly where your mind is. Again, Satan wants to bedazzle you, right? Even right now, and I've, I've said this before, that it's almost very difficult to hold on to any excitement concerning any subject regarding um, supernatural things, isn't it? It's very difficult. You remember a while ago, many years ago, when you thought about or, or you thought about the concept of angels, how excited you would get and how that excitement would stay. But now if you think about the concept of angels, it's almost like there's no excitement. You remember how you used to get when you thought about salvation and that one day you would leave this world, go to a place that was utterly indescribable and you would be excited for days. Now you think about that same thing and it's very difficult to get excited at all. It's hard to keep your motivation concerning uh, things like that, isn't it? If we were honest and admitted this, I'm going to make a bold statement. I would say that most of us would say, yeah, it's pretty tough to hold on to. But why? Why is it tough to hold on to? Well, because it's promise. Those ideas are promise. Prophecy is a promise. So how do you get a person to begin to reject a promise? To begin to blank their mind towards a promise? You break them. You break them. Satan has been working very hard for the past 10 years, more than at any other time. Why do I say this? You guys, right? It's almost like we have no excitement that we can maintain within us about any given subject. You can hear of a subject, get excited in the moment, and it dies immediately thereafter. Why? Because all of those stories are promises. They're supernatural promises, they're prophecy, but they're still promises. How you get a person to not react on a promise is so beautiful. You hurt their hearts. You break their spirits in a specific way. In other words, Satan has been very busy assigning his little imps to do the exact same thing in everybody's lives. You ready? When you were able to accomplish something, in your head you imagined what it would be. You did. And you were happy. And you were excited. And you were motivated. Then Satan sent his angels out. His little imps out, not angels, I'm not going to call them angels. because uh, His little imps out, his little workers, anybody he could work through, he sent them directly to you to do what? To work against any promise you would have. To break the backs of those who would do anything to serve another. Right? If I, if Satan comes against me, right? But you don't know it. And he slows me down which he often does slow slow us down. He didn't stop us. He can't slow us down. If he slows me down, and then he goes to you and says, hey, didn't Mike say he was going to do so-and-so, and it's not done? What happens to you? You get weary with that subject. Now take that same sentiment and apply that to everything in your life, and you'll see exactly what Satan has been doing. With everything in your life, Satan has been doing the exact same thing. Why? Because it's highly effective. It's highly effective. When you try to attempt to do something for somebody else, Satan got in way and altered it, didn't he? He did. He discouraged many of you into believing that you could receive anything good because he stopped somebody else from giving to you. He put thoughts and ideas in people's heads to corrupt our thinking to a degree that we would actually withdraw ourselves into ourselves, turning away from all, going into ourselves, coming up with every problem, excuse, and everything else not to fellowship. That's what he's been doing. There were months where people had drawn into themselves, where they couldn't trust a soul, where that was the number one statement I can't trust. I remember the emails. A lot of people said, well, you know, it's very difficult to trust anybody these days. Now, when you see that word pop up through a bunch of emails, and it's the predominant word of all emails, for months on end, Satan has been busy. And yes, I do things like that because the Lord said, know the condition of your flock. So if, if God has given a oh, side note, 
If God is giving you charge over something, it does not mean that something is subject to you. It means you have an obligation to love that something with all of what you are. And in order to love that something with all of what you are, you must know the condition of that something. In this case, that's you. So when I go through your emails like that and I find out what words you guys are using the most, you'd be shocked at what you're saying all the time. Satan has been busy. As a consequence of that, when somebody makes a promise to you, it's almost like you hear it, but you don't hear it. You're not even going to set yourself up for it, right? You're already guarded against it. And then you have a lot of people who would say, it's a popular saying, they say, guard your heart. For what? Guard your heart for what? I told you guys, they go against the grain. But, but you've heard that term, guard your heart. Why? Because people have experienced this breaking of things within themselves, they can't explain it. They have seen the workings of other folks and they interpret that as them not being faithful, right? You know what the truth is? Satan has been very busy. He's been going in every nook and cranny and defiling anything he could to break the ideological process of promising your life. He does not want you to be motivated by any promise or any prophecy. If we were motivated by prophecy, no one would have to uh, uh, state the same prophecy twice. We would still be excited right now from what we learned years ago, but that's not the issue here. Satan has broken a peace within us. And so when it comes to promise or anything like that, we're broken concerning our hearing of that promise. Right? Now, so guess what happens? You're broken of that promise. You know that prophecy, all right? You, many of you think in your mind, well, prophecy could happen in another thousand years. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen immediately. Satan is going to take full advantage of this. Full advantage. And so when he puts it in the minds of those who are not covered by the blood of the Lamb to do what they do, they're going to bedazzle the world. They're going to do the unthinkable. And they're going to place that door there and somebody's going to walk through. And it will be beautiful. It will appeal to your eyes. Because a lot of people are tricked that way. They really do believe that because something is beautiful, it's good. I don't believe that at all. Most of the beautiful things I've ever seen in my life have been deadly. The ugliest things I've ever seen in my life as far as human standards have been quite loyal and true. It kind of reminds me of the four living creatures. I never once heard them described as beautiful, but frightening, yes. Not beautiful. <laughs> right? Not beautiful. Some of the angels, I've heard them described as not beautiful, but frightening to the point where you fall over dead. And somebody has to help you up, call an angel to get your heart. Your How do you, if, if somebody is taken in the spirit and they see an angel and fall over like they're dead in the, how does your spirit die? Right? I tend to think of eternal things absent the flesh. Beauty is a concept fashioned by the mind of those who are looking. Beauty is by way of perspective. What's beautiful to you may not be beautiful to me. It depends on what we see. Doesn't it? The truth is beautiful. It can be wrapped in many things, but it's still beautiful. I tend not to see the external shell, which fools a lot of people. But I desire to see the internal truth back to Satan, though he's been very busy. He's been so busy that right now when they start talking about this release of classified information, it does not hold the excitement you thought it did. I remember a conversation one time with a colleague, and he said, what do you think would happen upon the release of some of this, some of this classified footage and some of these ops that we go through? I was thinking too, I was like, yeah, people would be, they would just be, they would be overwhelmed, right? With, with, uh, you know, that would be one of the most interesting things they could ever dive into, followed by, you know, mass hysteria and fear, but it would still have an impact. Well, they released it. Where's the impact? Where's the impact? They declassified it. The Pentagon said, yes, it's real stuff. No one cares. It's almost like no one cares. Prophecy is being fulfilled, though. It was a prophecy that said that people would become numb to such things. 
numb, right? That's fulfillment. And it's happening in just about everybody. That listen, when these things really begin to happen and when you begin to witness them, all it takes is an act of kindness, not in a way that we understand kindness, but a, a, a contribution to us by these things. And kapook, people are going to be hooked. They're going to be hooked. Because as a whole, people have not seen them as a populace. So what happens if everybody saw them right now? I would say the greater majority of the population would be frightened. But if you wear down people a little bit more, Satan knows this season. He knows about the geology of this season. He knows about the volcanic eruptions. He knows about the tsunamis. He knows about the earthquakes. He knows about the financial difficulties and food and everything else. The Bible says when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He knows what he did in the past to plant seeds so people would dig it up today and start teaching everybody else about the new findings they dug up that was in fact planted by Satan. Satan knows what civilizations he tampered with to get them to believe in a specific way. And then us poor people up in this modern day and age, we dig up something, start reading it, believing it's true because of the age of it. Satan knows exactly what he did, and he's been working on this plan from the beginning. He's worked through all the generations for this plan. So if you think you can just, you know, wipe it away, you're wrong. Jesus already told us there's but one way. There's but one way, and that is that you be covered by the blood of the Lamb. That's how you make it. So Satan has been extremely busy doing what he's doing. Extremely busy. He has altered how we see things, how we receive things, and he's taken the joy out of a great many things. He did this through causing, he's been working very hard through people, through the cracks of our lives, to cause us to work against each other, to cause us to be highly offended. And you remember Jesus, when Jesus said, it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to through who they, woe to him to through who they come, right? So that means offenses have to come into the world. People will be offended by one another, but I'll tell you something, you don't have to act upon those offenses. the consequence of this numbness that people are feeling the implications of this new release of information is somewhat passive right now how many people would say they're spiritual right now you're real spiritual how many people would say that most of us would right because we are people of faith right but are you bothered by the large group of kids that died this morning? Most people don't know. Now listen to me. I'm not here to test you. I'm going to bring a point out in this. Is anybody sickened by the large number of kids that died this morning? Children. Last night, there was another group of women who were captured by these crazed individuals who sell women into uh, uh, the, the, the sex slave movement. Right? They were actually rescued last night, 152 of them. Was anybody excited about that? The truth is, nobody knew about that. Chances are, very few people know about the children this morning. My point is this. Part of our numbness that we have, we have inflicted upon ourselves. And let me tell you why. Right? Because there was a time that we were sensitive to things. And you guys remember about uh, maybe 20 years ago, right? Let me give you a scenario so that you understand what I'm talking about. You'd be sitting around, all of a sudden you'd have a thought. You'd be thinking, you'd have a thought. You wouldn't really, you, you weren't looking at any computer or anything like that because it wasn't too many around at that time. But you'd have a thought. You'd follow up by help them, Lord, because you didn't know if it was real or not. And then you would find out later on that it was real. That whatever you felt in your heart was justified because you found out that it was a real issue happening in the world. It was a real issue. And he, you guys have gone through this, 
right? Where you're just sitting there, you kind of zone out, you start thinking about something, but then you're moved by it and come to find out whatever you were moved by was absolutely real in the world. And it used to happen quite frequently with people who believe. When the internet came out and people could look up anything they want, we stopped depending upon the spirit in that way. Why would anybody have to go into prayer and meditation when they can simply look it up on Google or MSN or Yahoo or AOL at the time? Why would we do, you know, all this other stuff where we can get pure data? As a consequence of that, we haven't been dependent upon the spirit as we once were. Right? In, in other words, and when you're not dependent upon something, it goes down a notch by way of its importance and priority. You start utilizing the internet more and more to the point where if somebody tells you something, you have to go verify it by the internet. You have no idea outside of the internet. You have jumbled thoughts. Anybody have jumbled thoughts about things? You try? Anybody ever try? To have that, uh, to get spiritual insight, but all that comes is a bunch of noise and confusion. Anybody go through our exercise? The exercise I introduced here at COT when I said, like, when you lay down at, in your bed at night, silence your mind. And a lot of people said, well, I can't do that. I start thinking about bills. I start thinking about this situation, that situation, that situation, right? And they still have no silence. That's internal noise. Internal noise. Normally a person with this internal noise, but they can't shut it up because they haven't dealt with it. And we don't deal with it because we're always sidetracked by the internet. In fact, most people these days spend the greater amount of their time behind a device. And of that time, they spend a great deal of time searching. Searching for days on the internet. Anybody ever have one of those, you, you became a search zombie? Anybody ever do that? That means you, you initially go to your computer for one thing, but you end up looking at everything. Because every time you put in a search, a list comes up. And nowadays, that list will pop up with something very uh, interesting to you. And so you kind of deviate and you click on that link. That link takes you to another link. That link takes you to another. And before you know it, you have wasted an entire day on nothing. See, before computers were like that, we would just meditate, think about spiritual things. And sure enough, clarity would come. And then we'd find out later on that what we were moved by was real. And we began to grow, and then the Internet came out. Now, when the Internet came out, because your searches can't are manipulated, that's the power of AI. Can you imagine that? AI can change the direction of your search as often as it wants to, and it knows you well. It knows you well. It knows you well. So it can alter your search and change your mind when it wants to. It knows the best insertion point. It knows when you're fatigued. It knows when you're not fatigued. It knows when you're truthful. It knows when you're lying. And it knows that by the way you type. And that was in its younger days. It's far more capable now. Right? So we have relaxed a part of ourselves we absolutely need during this time. As a consequence of us relaxing that part of ourselves, that dependency upon the spirit, a numbness has come in. And it's very difficult for people to maintain joy in their lives, isn't it? Every single last one of you can be honest here. I'll be the first one to tell you it's very difficult to maintain joy. Now, nothing messes with my peace nor my joy of the Lord. But I'm telling you now, there's something fighting against joy in your life. Because when you would reach that moment in your homes, it's almost like a tornado breaks loose in a situation somewhere. There's always something to grab you. And to escape the situations now, people go to the Internet. They make themselves busy. 
And in so doing, they're further numbed by what they find. Hmm? Nothing wrong with a computer unless you give yourself over to it. Right? So in this way, most of the info today, most of this groundbreaking info, it goes in one ear and out the other for a lot of people. It's just not moving. It's not moving. That's how you know Satan is about to set the whole world up. Because when it's not moving, when you have those points of numbness, when you're not moved by the stories you used to be moved by, right? When you can't hold on to your joy and your peace and promises have been broken so much that you're very skeptical about anything that would happen in the future, right? You convince yourself, well, I can't set myself up to be disappointed again. There are so many people primarily focused on that that they're missing out on life, period. Because anybody who does that is voiding works that could take place in their lives. Plus, you gave your life to Christ. What are you doing directing your own steps? If you can agree that Jesus is your Messiah, your Savior, and Lord, then why do you take your own steps? I thought you trusted him. See how that works? See how that when Satan starts working, and he did this to other cultures, and one of the first telltale signs was people became violent one toward the other. That began with offenses. And that was increased by the people's distrust of government, sound familiar? That happened in every single civilization that ever fell. The people did not trust the government. The government began to do things to try and get the people's attention, their trust and loyalty. Then the people formed groups with different ideologies. And those groups began to fight against one another. And then calamity came. And when the calamitous times had come that wiped out the resources and the food and the prosperity and the comfort and the little paradises men make unto themselves, everybody was put back on the same plane. And when everybody was put back onto the same plane, nobody had an identity. Because all those times, Egypt, for example, those people, what they left, they eat Egyptians, they loved to record everything. Just like we do. We put things in a newspaper. They put things on stone. They put things in parchment. They wrote down everything. And you know what they wrote down? How they felt as time progressed, coming closer to the destroyer. And do you not know it matches the exact same things we go through today? Do you know that? The exact same things, the exact same policies, everything is a mirror of what happened in Egypt. And it's happening right now. They had speaking stones back then. That sounds funny, doesn't it? But they did. They had speaking stones. And from one water's edge, somebody could talk to another from another's water's edge. They had steel fish during that time. They didn't tell you about that, did they? And their societies did the same thing ours is doing. The people lost faith in Pharaoh in the governments. Then the governments changed. And the governments started to appeal to the people. But, but, they started having volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. They started having the intensified storms. They started having more and more lightning. They were even changing the food because of the conditions. So they had GMO too. They had genetically modified organisms that would go into the corns and into the grain to change it, to do certain things to the body. They were experts on medicine, too. They had heart surgeons, surgeons, period. Do you guys know that? They had tiny little tools they would work with. They did brain surgeries in Egypt. See, it's not like the movies at all. In the movies, they portray them as being these archaic people who didn't have anything. That's not the truth. That's why parts of Egypt are classified to this very day. But they had slaves. Do we have slaves? Maybe everybody missed this. When you read about the Exodus, what were the people doing? They were working. That's what they were doing. They were 
working. They had homes. They had houses, ladies and gentlemen. They had small businesses for themselves. Their bondage, as God had described it, was to be in a land that was not theirs, that they they couldn't call that land theirs. Their birthright land, right? They couldn't call it that. They were slaves to the Egyptians, and what the Egyptians would do is anybody outside of that Egyptian heritage would be a slave to the Egyptians in this way. They would serve the economy. They would work for the economy. That's what a slave was. And if you were not a slave, you were part of the controlling class of people, just like today. You have politicians, and you have all the other people who are employed. The people who are employed, the same definition of slavery matches a person who is employed. They even, in Egypt, they even introduced the concept of competition. They even, you know, psychologically, they have writings. They said, well, the people are becoming restless. We need something where the people can relieve some of the restlessness, and they came up with these games where people would sit there and see violent things. People kill each other to pieces. And what they said out of their mouths was it was enough to satisfy people. So we're going to have these ever so often so people can come down and view them. That's why when you go to places like in, in ancient Rome, they had the gladiators. Why? Because the people would have a restless tension that would build up from things not going in their favor. And before they had a meltdown, they had to have an avenue where that can be released. So they would witness the violence other people would commit in the arena. And that was enough to keep the people calm again. They would have a relief mechanism for all of that built up tension, anxiety, Everything that would go wrong, it would build up in a person, and they knew they had to make some sort of relief point for that. We copied everything they did right here in this land. By the way, the United States is formed of Grecian and Roman philosophies. That's why they called it the Great Experiment. They didn't even know if one could survive by way of democracy, but they recreated a part of Rome. Even the Senate, is that that's Roman. The Congress is Roman. The Senate is Roman. Republicans and Democrats, that's Roman terminology. Isn't that something? Laws and bills and all that, that was taken from Greece and Rome. That's exactly how they did things. Voting. Certain chambers, all this is Grecian and Roman philosophies. And they pay great homage to Egypt, which is why you see the Egyptian iconography in all the capital centers. You see the Roman buildings of operation, right? Because we operate like the Romans. We have our academic backing, right? That was taken from the Grecians because they were the wisest in the land, the most academic in the land. And as far as Egypt is concerned, you have a structure of rule that applies to everybody. And we took that from Egypt. That's very well documented. And it's no big secret. That's what we are. It's just a shame that a lot of people, they're not even acquainted with that these days. Ladies and gentlemen, Satan has been busy from day one. But so was our father. Our father's been busy too. Satan, because you believe in Christ, he had no power to kill you. Because normally he would have killed you already. He had no power to do that. Because you still believe in Christ, you're not going to end up being a robot like everybody else. You see things. Which is why you carry conflict. How many people have conflict about the craziest things? It's like an internal conflict. It's it, it's almost like, I don't know if the Lord would be pleased with this. And sometimes you find yourself shutting everything out that's holy so you can continue to be like everybody else for a moment. How many have done that? You don't have to hide it because we all know that we have been in those seats. Why? The only way you would have to shut out all thoughts of the spirit is because of that internal conflict. 
that Jesus said would be inside of us. The spirit and the flesh do war against one another. This is continuously. And when it rises, right, so does a mandate. Satan has been busy from day one. What he's doing in the world right now, he planned this from day one. It's going like clockwork. And I shared with you guys the part of the contents of a notebook. What's happening right now, we discussed back then in that archive. I believe that was about five years ago. Because I sat there and I read you certain things out from the pages of this manual. Amazing what the Lord has uncovered for the sake of his people. And if you heard that broadcast, you would have understood that there's nothing out of order happening this day and age. You remember back then I said, God will always have somebody in the body of Christ that will absolutely know all the devices of the enemy. He'll know Satan's plan. In the body of Christ, we will be informed. We're not going to be lost in the sauce. We're going to be informed, highly informed. But here's the tricky part. When I said that back then, I said, sang it now. Many people will not remember. I give you guys a principle about something. No doubt some of you have gone through this yourselves. Something that happens. If you were to know the outcome of the doings of anybody, right? Suppose you guys were spouses. Suppose you said, you said, now, if God showed you or you just saw your wife go shop in a store and if she picks up a can of green beans or something like that, she's going to trip and fall and break her ankle. And you knew for a fact, if she picked up that can of green beans, that would happen. And so you go and tell her, you say, listen, don't pick up a can of green beans. Whatever you do, don't even touch it. She goes, okay. As soon as she gets to the store, what does she do? She grabs the green beans. First item. Falls, breaks her ankle. Then you ask her, why didn't you listen to me? And she say, listen to me about what? Well, didn't I just tell you not to touch the green beans? I, I was trying to help you. They say, well, you never talk to me about green beans. I give you a principle. If you ever have insight, one of those deja vu moments into something that is about to happen. If you do tell anybody, guess what? No one's going to remember you told them a thing. Because you're not going to alter what God has put in motion. If he ever compliments you by showing you something like that, then have an understanding behind it. Don't seek to change it. Because you're not going to change it. And before you say, well, what if Satan shows you something? Right? My question to you is, has Satan showed you anything? Because if he has shown you things, we need to have a discussion. But if he has not shown you things, don't go into the what if field, right? You guys heard that saying, if if was a fifth, we'd all be drunk. So let's not go into the what if thing. The what if thing is no good. That's assumption at its best. You start following that what if uh, um, uh, logic. You're going to lock yourself in a house and never come out again. So don't do that. Live your life by what is. Not the what ifs. You'll find that with what ifs, when a lot of people come up with what ifs, they start relocating and all this other stuff. That's not going to help a soul. Let me share with you a fact. Anybody caught at low altitude is going to have a water problem. Anybody caught at high altitude is going to have a radiation problem. All those stuck in the middle are going to have a water and radiation problem. There's no place to run. Just like the Lord said. There is no safe place when those days come up on the earth. None. There's no place anybody can run where they won't be touched. That is men's imagination trying to save their own behinds. Don't live your life to save your own behinds. Exist to protect those God put under your charge. That's what you do. But stop running. Don't, don't live your life running all over the place. You're going to see mountain ranges fall. How safe will those places be then? See, people always count on the, geolo the geology of the earth is not going to change. And so they say, ooh, that's a high mountain. Let me go run and live there. Don't do that. You're going to see mountain ranges split in half and fall. You're going to see that with your own eyes. And then you'll know there's no safe place except the Messiah. 
God is merciful, even in our brainless hours. But um, I knew some folks who wanted to know a location they could run within the U.S. that was safe. And I told them, don't ever run. Make yourself available. Stay in the path that Jesus will direct before you. And in so doing, by your request of prayer, he'll take care of your family. Because you'll walk in his will. If you're not walking in his will, he already told you. He will not hear those requests you make. He'll still have grace and mercy. But he'll be listening for that request of repentance. That request of true salvation. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then everything you ask will be given unto you. You know why? Why? You know why he said asking you shall receive only after a certain point. After you're obedient to the Lord, he'll hold nothing back because you will not ask for things of foolishness anymore. That's why. Right? You know what he says? Whatsoever you shall ask in my name. Right? That will my father do. Well, guess what? If you're obedient, you're not going to ask for anything foolish. You won't. You're going to have, there's going to be a change over you. But don't spend your time running. Don't run away. You need not run. You're going to find that all these places people have run to, they're going to be target zero. Right? Target number one. It's not going to be good. The Bible tells us all about this. The ark is Christ. Mm. I'll be back in a minute right here at COT, guys. I'm ranting. I just ranted. I did. I haven't ranted in a long time. I just ranted. We're going to go back to the water issue because I want you guys to have a grasp on this. It's going to change everything a lot sooner than anybody ever planned on. And they're pouring lots of money into brand new preparations. I'll be right back in just a few moments right here at COT. I can't even talk today. Ooh, that's not good. I'll be right back, everybody. Okay, guys, we're back. So you guys know about this. This ice sheet, the one we talked about, is one of a few dozen that pose massive issues out to the earth, and, and it's going to be immediate. You're looking at about a, about a two-year period. I, I would give an average of a two-year period. In fact, many things are over a two-year period. Don't become frightened. We have a lot of details to go over regarding that geology so that you guys understand it but sometimes getting you to getting anybody to see what's happening is very difficult right it's very difficult so simply put that ice sheet is like a diving board the land is where the diving board on the bottom contacts the concrete that line where it connects is going back further and further it's melting away because of ground temperatures it will fall in. Now keep in mind, the numbers, uh, the projected numbers have been decreasing. The time span, right, have been decreasing from the uh, what they projected a few years back compared to right now today. It's a stark contrast. Because again, it was supposed to be in 31, uh, 20. Now that projected date, and it used to be just a, just a, um, just a uh, year ago, I believe it was, and the exact amount was about, it was a few months to a year ago, it was 2030. But now that projected date, which is somewhat concrete, in the minds of those who are actively researching this thing, is two to three years. So you see that? It went from a, a, about a thousand years to some... 30 years out, 20 or 30 years out, now it's down to two or three years. What's it going to be in the next couple of months? All right, we're looking at something imminent is what we're looking at, something imminent. And that's just one of a few issues that we're going to face. Are people going to survive this? Of course they are. 
Of course they are. But it is, it is partially my responsibility to get you guys to see it. Okay. To, to really see it. Now, the one thing with this issue, folks, hear me out on this. What time is it? Oh boy, it's getting late. Hear me out on this. I want you guys to listen to me. Nobody go anywhere. I want you guys to listen to me. This isn't necessarily about COT. This is about you. There's a change in most people these days. Right? I know the numbness people deal with. I know the frustrations people deal with. But this is also your time to fight the good fight of faith. I say that because even I can observe ministries out there. Some of you guys have ministries and you know the struggle involved. Somehow the body of Christ has to alleviate that, right? I know it personally because even in COT, now this is not about COT, but you guys have ministries that you go to and many people withdraw from doing things. I know this because when our numbers go down like they have been going down, then they certainly have gone down in other places. COT is down just for us. We're down from the donations we used to receive. We're down 70% from where we were, right? 70%. But the number of listeners has increased, but we're down in donations. Now, now, if I know COT has that, then other ministries have the same thing. Don't take away from the other ministries like that. Try to take care of them as best you can. Don't let them fall apart. Please don't let them fall apart. That, that's, that's a, don't let them fall apart. Please don't let them fall apart. Because I'll tell you something. It's happening to more and more organizations out there that the P, and, and I know the struggle that's out there in the world. Trust me, I know it better than most of you. But with all of what you are, Right? Seek the Lord and don't let these ministries fall apart. The ones that you guys feed from, don't let them fall apart. Don't ever let Satan convince you somehow somebody's okay, this, that, and the other, whatever the case is. Don't do that. Don't let them fall apart. Because I'll, I'll say it again. I know if we have that here, then other ministries, they're undergoing the same thing. It, that's going to cause unnecessary pressure. And uh, this is a time when all of us need to fight. Right. Because I'll tell you something with some of the listeners that people, if, 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 if every listener gave 50 cents, I, I'll tell you right now, these half these ministries will be set free, but that's not happening for some reason. So please don't withdraw your hand from these ministries. Right. If you feed from it, take care of the restaurant you feed from. Because God puts that ministry in your capable hands is what he does. That's, that's the way he works. There have been times in the Bible where his houses went down to nothing. And when they went down to nothing, you know what he said? He said, because my house is, is not, in sh your houses look beautiful, but my house looks raggedy because it's not, you know, nobody's taking care of it. I'm going to make your houses reflect that. That's what he said back in, that, that was uh, in the Bible. That's a, that's a story in the Bible, right? But Satan is trying with all he has to squash out this message. Of Christianity. He, he's doing his best. And if you're not careful, right? He, he can cause a numbness in you that it, it'll be of no consequence to you. Because when a ministry falls out there, all, you know what people say? Well, I told you it would fall one day. No, not knowing the principle of Christ and what Jesus said. You know why Je they couldn't kill Jesus? Because of the crowds. Because the Father put the crowds in place to protect Jesus, to protect the disciples. That was mentioned in the Old Testament, and it came true in the New Testament. I can say this for sure. Because of you guys, I'm still here. Without you guys, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be here. I would have been squashed away a long time ago, right? Because I'm not exactly on a uh, nurturing side of the world, right? Not exactly that. But I hope you guys understand that. So when you go listen to these ministries that you go listen to, make sure you don't withdraw your hand from them. Don't let them fall under. 
That's exactly what Satan would just love to have. So he can have some sort of controlled message, some standard message out there, a controlled message that agrees with all the policies of the world, right? To just try and do away with people. Listen, that goes for, if you're, if you're involved in a ministry, then don't turn your back on that ministry. Don't do that. The only reason I say COT is different is because I, I work differently, right? I work under stress anyway. And I like things to happen spiritually. I don't really say anything about donations. But that 70% drop, that's a big dip. That's a big drop. It strains things. And I know those other ministries are at a borderline. They have to be at a borderline. Don't let that happen to them, please. Take care of them. All right? Take care of them. Take care of them. Folks, listen, we have a lot of details to cover about geology. Those are going into the nerd courses. I wanted to introduce this one tonight because this is more of an immediate problem that most people realize. Does it have anything to do with global warming? Not as it is. It's explained by uh, some of those who would seek to tax people with carbon or something like that. Not that way. This is happening solar system wide. All these things are happening solar system wide. And our heat is being generated from the ground up. Right? I had a note I did not read to you guys. Because I might save that for the, the midnight hour. But it deals with volcanism. Volcanism. We haven't seen volcanism here. And there are some properties about volcanoes. There are three types of volcanoes, actually, that spit out three types of material. One type we've not seen. In fact, one type has not been seen in... It's got to be... Uh, 12, 24,000 years, right? And it's it's very dangerous. But as of late, they have detected two volcanoes with this material at the lip of them, and they're warming up. And if this stuff starts coming out, uh, well, it's going to be truly different then. But with all these things happening, to have situational awareness by way of the truth, not not to bury your heads in the sand, right? But to have that situational awareness by way of the truth, will restore some of the motivations that have been lost within us. And when these things come to pass right before your eyes, you will see them. We're going to be here talking about this very thing. I'm telling you when the water goes up in many different places. We're going to be talking about it. And during that time, I'll likely be in a different subject, but we're going to be talking about it. You guys are going to be listening I'm telling you now, you're going to be listening and water is going to be taken over in so many different places. There are going to be people out there frightened and scared. I don't like water problems. I don't. I know how stressful they can be. The world is aligning itself to escape the responsibility of water woes. I can tell you that right now. They're going to escape the responsibility of having to put out anything to protect people under these water woes. So it's good that you have situational awareness concerning it. Now, anybody can debate this all they want. I'm not going to debate. I'm going to prepare myself to speak to people during this time with maps and graphs and things of that nature. Active tracking probing, whatever it takes, anything that can save a life, that can assist someone to get out of a danger area. People are going to be driving during that time. You don't want somebody cut off on the highway. They're going to be folks cut off on highways. They can't, they won't be able to get back to certain places. And so it'd be good to have some sort of situational awareness in this. This story, this, this subject I'm talking about to you tonight is going to become a big story in the weeks ahead, not necessarily just by COT either. It'll be a big story. And we're going to cover this, or well, I'll keep you posted on this, uh, often. Because it will affect the whole world. It'll be one of those first events that affects all of us. And we didn't even cover the sun. The chemistry change in the sun is real. It's very real. It's going to cause consequences to us and pressure issues. Barometric pressure is going to change across the board. That means fluids in your body are also going to fluctuate. And if anybody uh, understands this, yesterday, you would have had bursitis and arthritis issues yesterday. And if you think that was bad, 
We can tell you see what's coming, but there's a way to mitigate that. There are things about your body you need to know. God put things in place to mitigate a whole bunch. But the truth is, we're not educated to those things the Lord set up to take care of that. All right? They're very simple, cheap solutions. Nobody really has to spend money on. You can go out in nature and go fix yourself right now if you wanted to, if you know what you're doing. The Lord set that up all over the place. All types of grass carry something that hardly anybody knows about. All types of grass. Just about every known species of grass in America carries it. And in Europe, they carry it, right? But who do you hear talking about what medicinal purpose this grass has in it? External, not internal, right? Not no, You don't have to eat it. That's not what you do with it. Something external you do. That'll be like night and day in some of your aches and pains. The Lord set this stuff up for a reason. And that knowledge largely has been lost. But it's all coming back, right? It's all coming back. Folks, we have a lot more to cover, including uh, some of the preparedness about the governmental changes that are taking place. And you have to remind you about prophecy and some of the prophetic changes that were taking place specifically in the book of Jeremiah. So we might end up, we might end up doing a, a very in-depth study in the heart of Jeremiah to see a process. All of it will be to see a process. Once you see that process, you're going to look around and see a mirrored situation. We can also look at Egypt and you'll see a mirrored situation. In other words, what's happening today is not new. It happened back then and it's happening today just like it happened back then. Like somebody has uh, influenced today's culture and today's governments to act out of the characters that are in the Bible. I mean, it overlaps perfectly. And there are some findings, you guys, you need to know about that, especially you guys that live in California, right? There's some things you need to know. Uh, by the way, before we close, did you guys know that uh, Chinese banks are closing left and right? Do you guys know about that? I'm going to cover more of that with you in a topic uh, tomorrow during our Q&A period. But Chinese banks are closing like you wouldn't believe. They're closing. Like you wouldn't, and that's going to cause some severe, you know how Russia is under pressure right now. They were under such pressure that they started a fight. China's going to follow suit. They will likely join forces. Now, I know this seems unorthodox, not neatly packed into the paradigm most people are used to. But we have some situations going on that are quickly speeding up. We'll cover that also. Things are changing so fast. But don't worry about it. Don't feel rushed yourselves. Lord willing, Lord willing in this place, we'll do our due diligence to keep people informed about all these topics and more as best we can. Somehow, some way, God will have his people set up to be informed because he said he would not have you ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. Those are the plots and plans of the enemy. So somebody out there is going to carry exactly what the enemy is up to. You'll always know in the body of Christ, always. And we certainly know in this house, don't we? Right? This will, this can help somebody. It really can. Often it encourages people not to go down the dark roads. Often it does. Right? Guys, remember those things. Understand this about the ice sheets. That's an immediate issue. We have a, we have some more to cover on that too. Some dynamics that can easily be taught to you so, so that you can see exactly what's happening. Uh, I want you to see it for yourself so you can actually get it, understand it. And when that time comes, you won't have a conniption fit because of it. You'll just have an understanding of why things are happening the way they are. Okay. But we'll certainly cover that. Hey, I want to say God bless each and each and every one of you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at the Council of Time. That'll be tomorrow, possibly at midnight. Or, or no, if it, listen, a midnight hour is going to be about, uh, that'll be about 12 central. Okay. Not Eastern central. So it's about what? One, 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 15 or something like that. Okay. One fifteen in the morning. If we have a midnight hour. So if you guys are up and you ever see the player turn back on, that's me coming on for a midnight hour. Okay. And again, midnight hours are designed to talk about those subjects. 
that are not very uh, appropriate to talk about during settings like these. It's a very special audience that, that I invite during the midnight hour, and those are the folks who struggle with uh, real things that nobody has. Um, they really can't discuss those topics uh, during the daytime when you have that broad audience. At night, it's a bit more narrowed down. You can get very intimate with the information and some of the causes and effects of, of these anomalies that are happening in people's lives. The purpose of it is so that people can be free, so they can finally be free. So they also can be established, and believe it or not, there are a lot of people affected by things just like that. So if you if you ever notice the players turning on uh, at 1 a.m. Eastern, right, then that's what that is. It means we're going to tackle a subject, okay? With that, I'm going to say God bless each and every one of you. You guys continue to pray for Angela. Continue to play for Flash. And Sister Mayor, right? Pray for them. 37. Brother Robert, pray for them. Pooh Bear and uh, Angel, pray for them. Nikki and all those, pray for them, right? One day, Angel and I will show you the dynamic of the the, the, uh, Ring of Fire and Council of Time. We'll go over some of those dynamics. With the funny stories in between. We'll go over some of those dynamics. God bless you guys. I'm going to see you next time right here at the Council of Time. God bless and good night. And if I see you again, it's going to be at the midnight hour. God bless.